Good afternoon and welcome to the Animal Rights Committee's ninth webinar brought to you by the National Lawyers Guild New York City Chapter. I'm your host, Tamara Bedick. This afternoon, we explore America's obsession with exotic cats. Joining me is a fabulous panel of experts. First among them, the Honorable Congressman Michael Quigley of Illinois' 5th Congressional District. Congressman Quigley, welcome, and the floor is yours. Great, it's, uh, it's great to be with you. So a lot of thanks. Um, my first thanks is for, thanks for having me on and uh, getting a chance to talk to all of you and meet you. Uh, my second thanks is thanks for what you do uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, many of you are full-time uh, advocates or people involved with the care of big cats uh, and those that have been abused. Uh, my staffer who engaged me with this issue three years ago, Max, uh, and I traveled to Albany, in Indiana uh, a couple of weeks ago to visit a, a rescue facility. I think four of the cats from the entire uh, king were there. Um, so we learned a lot there. So thanks so much for what you do. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to help. Everybody who's watching this in one way or another can help either by donating or engaging or talking to your member of Congress uh, about the big cat safety bill. So uh, thanks for all of that. You know, and I'm aware I'm speaking to the choir. Um, and so I could detail the reasons why we need to do this. But I want you to keep something in mind. Uh, it's a very diverse country and Congress is a unique unique cross section of our country. And one of the things I've learned is it often takes more than one reason to get people to support a bill, right? I think most of us would support this bill because we know it's inhumane to have private ownership of cats, roadside zoos, the extraordinary horrible treatment that you have seen in, uh, in the show, in movies, social media, the clips you have shown already uh, that you'll be seeing again today. Um, you know, that, that should be enough, but uh, I think we also recognize the danger that putting these beautiful uh, cats in these positions poses not just to the cats, but to the people around them and the first responders who are often called uh, when things go awry. So, you know, I want you to think about that uh, as we move forward. Uh, I've been out, asked a lot, you know, how did this start? Uh, what was the genesis of this? Was this the Tiger King show? And actually we started before that <clears throat> was broadcast. Um, and uh, ownership of my wimpiness about this, I can't watch the show. Uh, I can't watch even the anti-cruelty commercials that come on late at night where they show animals in horrible conditions. It just, uh, it, it bothers me too much, all right? So my way to respond to that is to, is to get involved. And that often obviously means more than just writing a check. So that, that's how I got here. Uh, but I just want you to think about this as we move forward um, and why it's important to push from all sides on moving legislation like this forward. And uh, I think, you know, we passed this through the house once already. We're gonna pass it through the house again. And uh, I'm looking forward to joining a few of you, uh, hopefully in the Oval Office when, you know, President Biden signs this long overdue legislation. But, you know, it's not the only game in town. There's legislation dealing with anti, with cruelty issues and big cat issues that goes on all the time. Uh, I saw the map before we started about states and their varying levels of involvement. So there's a tremendous amount of oversight, uh, expenditures that need to be done by states and legislation that needs to be that passed all through there. So, you know, we're on the cusp of passing big cat. I don't want to gloss over that. It's incredibly important. So, uh, you know, we'll stay on that. But uh, uh, I will tell you the most important thing we have going for us are the advocates. Uh, if you know somebody, anybody else who hasn't reached out to their member of the house and big time member of the Senate to push them to ask that this bill be brought on the Senate floor. Uh, please do that. It's extraordinary, extraordinarily important. And um, 
as I said, there's a lot of legislation that, that goes on at the state and local level. And I want you to please be engaged with that. <clears throat> but uh, until we get this done, I wanna focus on big cap. Beyond that, there will, and there always has been a tremendous amount of legislation from the appropriation side to the authorization side that deal with animal issues as a whole. So let's latch on to this one, get it done, but please stay involved and engaged. Uh, you have a wonderful organization here. Uh, unify as much as you possibly can with others uh, to work on those issues. Uh, we recognize this is a, a lifetime commitment. Uh, there are always going to be battles like this, uh, as long as there are horrible situations and, and uh, monsters who don't know how to take care of beautiful animals. So uh, I have time to, if there's a few questions or just on the top of your minds, please let us know. But in, if not, you can always reach out to our office. My awesome staffer, Max, is uh, on top of this. And uh, Carol, we're gonna come down to Florida and, and visit your facilities as soon as we can and uh, help out anybody uh, as we can as time goes on. You guys have been awesome and we can't wait to meet you. Thank you, Congressman Quigley. And indeed, it looks like we have a problem. May 8th, an adolescent tiger stalking the suburbs of Houston. June 30th, an African serval jumping on a woman in Atlanta, Georgia. But still, you know, these might be isolated accidents. No one opens up dozens of cages to release ferocious animals onto their community, right? Sheriff Lutz? Well, you, you would think so, but uh, um, several years back, we've, uh, we've proven that that, uh, that can't happen. Mm. Can you tell us about it? Well, uh, you know, our incident uh, was, was one of, uh, uh, of its own. And, um, you know, as we, uh, as we handled this incident, uh, we were very familiar with the owner, um, but uh, not, not near as familiar with the numbers uh, that this owner had. And, um, you know, we're a, a, a large farming agriculture community, uh, about 86,000 population about 680 square miles. And uh, we had a lot of familiarity with this, uh, with this owner, uh, but had no idea of the numbers that he had uh, collected uh, on his farm. Uh, we had been there numerous times, um, but uh, um, just the sheer volume was, uh, was really incredible. Um, you know, we, uh, the, this call came in at about five o'clock and uh, I think I'll, I'll play it now for you. 2011 at 1700 on channel 12. Nine one one. Yes, this is Mr. Kopchak on Kopchak Road, and we live next to Terry Thompson, and there's a bear and a lion out. There's a bear and a lion out? Yeah, right up behind us. What's your name? Kopchak. What's your first name, ma'am? Dolores. And it's behind your house? Pardon me? Is it behind your house? Is it behind your house? Yeah, it's up in, and they're chasing their Terry's horses. I tried to get him, but there's no answer. Okay, I'll send him over. Thank you. Uh -huh. So that was the call. Um, you know, it's uh, very calming. Uh, uh, Dolores Dolly is what we call her. She lived beside Mr. Thompson for many, many years. She was very familiar with what he had there. And uh, luckily, uh, that was uh, why, uh, if you could say that we were successful in the fact that nobody got hurt um, and everything was contained to the farm was probably the reason uh, that was, was because of that call and how quick we got it. So, um, you know, our incident, uh, Mr. Thompson had, um, you know, numerous uh, exotic type animals. Um, we uh, uh, had had to do a, a list with uh, his caretaker to find out how many animals were on the property. Um, uh, we ended up getting to the point where it was about 56 animals that um, 
uh, he had uh, stored on this property, uh, mainly in, in cages, oversized dog cages, so to speak. And, um, um, you know, on this particular day, he had decided to, uh, to let some of them out. And um, uh, he also took his own life. And uh, this property sat just outside of the Zanesville state limits. It sat right along the interstate. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we, we very fortunately were able to uh, contain most of this to the property or just off the property. Um, put our deputies in a very bad situation. Um, you know, as they were responding there, um, they called myself at the house. Uh, I responded to the scene and, and heard what was going on. I heard where the animals were at. Uh, and uh, I was very familiar from being there before of what types of animals he had. And so I issued the order that um, if there were any animals uh, loose trying to get off the property, uh, that they, they were to be put down because we couldn't have those uh, types of animals running loose in our, in our area. So um, that was the start of, of how it went uh, on that night. Um, you know, we finished up at about 11 o'clock that night. There was a big rainstorm that came in the next day. Uh, as you can see, there's some pictures there on the screen of the aftermath of the next day. Uh, that, that picture was taken by uh, a volunteer, an unknown volunteer that helped us and, and ended up releasing it to the media, um, something that we really didn't think was needed. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that did happen. And, and um, we were left to, you know, take care of, of the aftermath. Um, we actually found a, a, a tiger uh, the next day that was on the backside of the property. Um, we, uh, our SRT team escorted a, uh, one of the vet techs down to try to tranquilize it, um, fired a shot and the animal kind of turned and started towards her through the woods. And we had to put that animal down as well. So it was just the sheer volume of what we knew, uh, you know, was going to happen. Um, and uh, it was a, you know, it really showed that we as deputies that work the road don't have the capability of dealing with uh, these cats. Um, and, uh, you know, you talk to everybody afterwards about, uh, you know, how you're supposed to take care of tranquilizing an animal and, and what goes into that um, is just uh, really outside our bailiwick. So, um, you know, there's a picture of where we were recognized for, for the event later on. Um, and uh, again, there's some of my information in case anybody would, uh, would want to have questions for us. So uh, I, I wanted to take about five minutes. I think my five minutes is about up. And um, we're just uh, really uh, 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 enthused and, and happy and, and belated that Ohio uh, took a step on creating uh, state laws. And uh, I've been uh, very adamant and uh, very uh, uh, try to do anything I can uh, with the federal law to get it passed and uh, we're willing to help out however we can. Thank you, Sheriff Lutz. Um, after the Zanesville incident, Ohio passed some of the toughest laws in the nation. South Carolina and Indiana followed. Should private ownership of exotic cats be regulated by individual states? Joining me now is Professor Carnian Nasser to describe the patchwork of state laws that we already have and to tell us if these are enough. Professor Nasser. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, give me a second while I get my, my screen up here to get... Um, where's my, all right, here we go. So um, one of the reasons, I mean, to answer your question in one word, no, these are not enough. That's why we're talking about the Big Cat Public Safety Act, because it will establish critically needed uniformity of law that, as you can see from this map, this infographic, um, doesn't exist. And so just to, just to kind of quickly go through what you're looking at here. You need to share your screen, Carney. Oh, I pressed share screen. See, why is it not doing that? Okay. Um, right. Okay. Can everyone see the map now? Okay, great. Okay, so <laughs> what you're what you're looking at now is the patchwork that we have. This is why it's so important that we pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act, because we really need to establish uniformity of law. 
So to go through the what your what each of these colors means, um, I'm going to start with the red. The red are the states that don't have any state level legislation regulating the private ownership of big cats. Now, that being said, Nevada did just pass legislation that prohibits public contact, for, it prohibits exhibitors from offering public contact with big cats. However, it's still red because it's still among those four states that doesn't have any oversight over the private citizen ownership of big cats. Now, the next level that you look at here is the orange states. Orange states have some sort of permit or license structure in place. And really every single state should have an asterisk here because even if states are within the same color scheme and fall within the same category of uh, relating to how they have approached the issue of private ownership of apex predators, all of them are still different. They have slight different tweaks. There, there are no states that have mirror laws. So for moving from state to state, very, very different legislation. Now that's been helpful to us in the past in the animal advocacy community. I mean, we've all heard that one of the reasons that Feld Entertainment decided to put an end to the Ringling Brothers Circus was because navigating the patchwork of laws that were popping up to um, to ban bull hooks and other weapons used in circuses was just getting to be too logistically challenging. However, here in this instance, it really creates a, a much easier framework for people to traffic and exploit big cats. Um, the next level is a partial private possession ban um, with exemptions. We see exemptions for USDA license holders and this is something that exhibitors have been very, very adept at bamboozling lawmakers about because what they say is, oh, well, you know what? You, you should exempt us because we are federally licensed and inspected. That sounds great to the untrained ear, really, right? Because it sounds like there's some level of like approval. There's some level of meaningful oversight when the reality is USDA itself has found that uh, in previous um, auditing reports that about 70% of USDA licensees with four or fewer animals in their inventory only sought to get a USDA license in order to circumvent state laws exempting USDA license holders, meaning they're private owners without an intent to exhibit who just want to keep owning their dangerous animals as pets. And then on the, on the dark blue level, you see these are the states that have some level of ban, ban that exempts USDA license holders, as, as I just mentioned. But um, for me here in Louisiana, for example, our state ban is very, very aggressive. It does exempt our AZA accredited zoos. It exempts um, colleges and universities that have live animal mascots. There's no way that that law would have passed if LSU hadn't been allowed to keep Mike the Tiger. Um, so as you can see, this is a huge patchwork. And much like the private possession, personal possession, I should say, of illicit drugs, there's no way to do that without interstate trafficking. So th the same is true for the private personal possession of big cats. You know, we saw three tigers in suburban neighborhoods in the state of Texas in three months. Um, you know, I've worked with the Louisiana law enforcement pulling tigers out of backyards in, in our state as well, despite the state ban. So these are laws that are just being um, disregarded because enforcement is so lax or um, easy to circumvent because, you know, for every cat who actually is confiscated, you have to imagine how many are out there that are not. And the risk when it comes to trafficking these animals is so low compared to the financial reward for moving them around. Um, so that is really, this is just a very brief, quick overview. We could have an entire week long seminar about um, the patchwork and inefficacy of the state laws. But this is one of the reasons that we need the Big Cat Public Safety Act to pass. Um, 
And before I just quickly wrap up and hand it off, I'm just going to say that there's there are a couple of other types of, of regulation that we do see the, the ban on public contact that we have in states like New Hampshire, New York, Nevada, Kansas, and Arizona um, is really important. Um, it does disincentivize the breeding for public contact for these lucrative public contact opportunities that create this breed and dump cycle. Um, so the animals who get dumped into the exotic pet trade typically originate with these cub petting experiences. It's only offered these cats for public contact between eight and 12 weeks of age, those, those experiences are extremely lucrative. But once they age out, those animals become financial and safety liabilities and they get dumped or worse. Um, so those states have passed prohibitions on exhibitors. They may not, you know, their exhibitors are still allowed to operate, but they can't offer public contact. And that's one of the elements of the Big Cat Public Safety Act that is so critically important is to eliminate that financial incentive. Thank you, Professor I think Nasser. I went over my five minutes. <laughs> Um, can you uh, stop sh screen sharing, please, Professor Nasser? Yep. Great. Thank you very much for that. Now, some of our audience already knows that you are starring in an award-winning Michael Weber documentary, The Conservation Game. And with us this afternoon is your co-star, Tim Harrison, Director for, of Outreach for Animals. Now, Director Harrison, when you said to me that convicts, drug dealers, and child molesters are converging in this cub petting industry, I was completely floored. But you did a video on this and investigated this. And um, can, we, can we share your video clip, please? Absolutely. It's more nefarious than you think it is. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Go right ahead. Is it, is, is it viewer discretion advised? No. Okay, here we go. Disaster training facilities in the United States of America. They teach a unified command for weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, and natural disasters. I'm also director of outreach for animals, an organization of police officers, firefighters, paramedics, emergency room doctors, pediatric physicians, and veterinarians who all get together and try to teach proper behavior around wildlife. If you want to see what I do, I'm highlighted in two award-winning documentaries, The Elephant in the Living Room and The Conservation Game. I am truly a human animal advocate. Now, I'm also a specialist in public safety. That's what I do. I'm an expert in that. We're going to put the animals to the side. We're going to strictly work and talk about the human part of it, the people that are the conservationists that you're going to these facilities and, and, and handling the animals with. These individuals are like to call conservationists because they're not what you think they are. And the problem is, is a lot of people are, uh, do not know this and do not do their homework before they go there. Let me introduce you to some of the most notorious and nefarious conservationists in the world. First one is Mario Trabu, T-A-B-R-A-U-E. Now Mario in the 1980s, according to federal prosecutors, served as the chairman of the board of the largest drug trafficking operation in the United States of America. He allegedly stored 10,000 pounds of marijuana in the Parrot Jungle Miami tourist attraction. Now we all been there, using exotic animals as a front. His drug network was worth over $75 million in his height. Now, one of the notorious things that his henchmen and his organization did was they killed an ATF agent, Larry Nash, they murdered him, dismembered him with a chainsaw and burned his body by setting it on fire. They were able to arrest and capture him by doing undercover work by an operation called Operation Cobra, because he also sold Cobras also. And the one thing about Mario is that Mario, he was supposed to get a life sentence. He only served 12 years due to his cooperation with, as an informant. He was released in 2001 and currently uh, is, um, is working with his organization, a nonprofit called Zoological Wildlife Foundation. 
He was recently lobbied, lobbied Congress to kill all legislation cracking down on similar exotic animal parts. And one of that legislation he was fighting is the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Mario made more money safely selling and exploiting endangered wild exotic animals safely because there was no legislation to stop him than selling drugs. That should tell you how big the, the industry is of animal encounters and handling and getting your pictures taken. His facility was one of the highest rated tourist attractions in Florida. Now Mario, to add to that, Mario also was the individual that Al Pacino, and he's very proud about this, Al Pacino used his character as Scarface, as what, how he acted in the movie Scarface. So that tells you right there what we have involved with that. Just remember, that's where you take your children, that's where you take your family. And this is an individual that was, was somebody I wouldn't trust with my family. Next on our list is, as a lot of you watched The Tiger King, it was a mini series that was on uh, Netflix. Tiger King is Joe Exotic. Joe Exotic is also known as Joseph Malinado Passage. Well, Joe Exotic has been sentenced to 22 years for murder for hire to kill one of his uh, uh, predecessors, one of his individuals he didn't like by the name of Carol Baskin. And for the uh, violating of the Lacey Act and Endangered Species Act, which means he killed endangered species when he was done with them and buried them on his property. Now, the best quote that came from Joe Exotic has a miles long, two mile long list of problems when it comes to people and you know outside the animal industry, criminal activity, drugs, things of that nature. He was also known for giving drugs and alcohol to young men to get them to help save him, you know, stay with him and be on his property and help him out. It's another kind of form of a cult using young men. We have young women, we have young men with him. So one of the things I, I thought was unusual is one of the quotes that came out during the hearing from Edward Grace, assistant of director of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Office of Law Enforcement. He said, wildlife crime is often connected with other criminal activity, such as fraud, narcotics, money laundering, and smuggling. And I like to add into that also uh, child trafficking when it comes to young kids underage. Because everywhere I go to see these places, there's always underage men, young men and women working these and looking up to their heroes, the, uh, the conservationists, the cult leaders. So it's highly unusual. We look at these situations where people have control over these individuals with power, say it's like Mario, you know, threatening power, or from some form of drugs or alcohol. And these are the people that you're bringing your children in to get their pictures taken with and trusting them with uh, large predatory animals around your children. Now, one of the individuals that the, the Joe Exotic was involved with was uh, J.C. Hart Pence. J.C. Hart Pence was one of his companions that he was one of his lovers after a period of time, but he was a young man when they came together to get to know each other. And as time went on, they became a couple. Now, this is what happened to J.C. Hart Pence. It was Joe's second partner. He was not so fortunate as some of the other ones. One actually sadly shot himself by accident. Others have not come out so well being involved with the situation in that place. Uh, an individual talked to him on a phone that was an investigator from the Lyon Correctional Mental Health Facility in Kansas. After he left the zoo, he said his life continued on a downward spiral. He was convicted in 2006 of molesting children younger than 14 years old. This is a guy that you're he was playing with your children with a tiger cub when you were paying him money to do it. And he also murdered a man in Kansas in 2014. He would spend the rest of his life in prison. I just want people to understand these are the individuals that you're dealing with. These are the individuals that, that people will uh, take their kids to and allow them to be involved with these conservationists. Now, hot off the presses, as we were speaking, I was, I was developing this. I got a, an attorney has sent me some information that I kind of surprised me too. There's so much, I don't have time to get everybody's name in here. The roll call of uh, molesters and sexual deviants that are involved with these facilities. But there's three child molesting cases right off the bat that I have to put on this, uh, uh, this video with me. One was Dade City Wild Thing. Some of you may remember them on like Good Morning America and those shows like that, where they showed them people swimming with the tiger cubs in the pool. Now these individuals are getting, the, the humans are getting in the pool with the children with a tiger, get that now, for birthday parties, pay to play, encounters. Uh, Randy Stearns, he's president of Dade City Wild Things. He was arrested and jailed in Missouri for sexual misconduct. 
Now we'll go down to Jungle Safari as a petting zoo and also encounter group. There was a Daryl Raymond, who was one of their higher executives, the CEO at the time, accused of sexually abusing young girls. And he's still awaiting what's going to happen to him. The third one I got here that I just have to say is I think I'm pronouncing this right Pi May Tuning Deer Park. Pi May Tuning Deer Park. It was a Bruce A. Skanky. He pled no contest to having sex with 14 year old or younger girl, girls. And the funny part about this, he's waiting for a sentencing. It could be 10 to 20 years before uh, that he's going to be put in the prison. These are the individuals that people have paid money with their children. These are just a few, just a few, tip of the iceberg. Pay money to go and let their children play with them and exotic animals. So we sort of got to start thinking about it. Yeah, the animals, yeah, they're in danger all the time. But start thinking about it also, too. Your children, your family are being put in the hands of individuals that you would never do it in the first place. Check out these facilities. Check these people out. They're easy to do. Get on the computer. You can check them out. You'll see their criminal history. You'll find out what's going on. And before you take your family to a location like that, why would you let your family and friends go near any of these places where people like that would work? Thank you, Director Harrison. Now, you mentioned Randall Stearns, who was getting into the pool with children and with baby tigers and playing with those children and tigers at Dade City Wild Things. In 2016, PETA sued Stearns for animal cruelty, for taking baby tigers away from their moms, for forcing cubs to interact with the public even when they were clearly exhausted from swimming and when they risked drowning. Our next panelist is PETA's Deputy General Counsel, Brittany Peet. Ms. Peet, can you describe PETA's litigation efforts? Yes, absolutely. And I will do my best to get through all of this material in five minutes. It's a whole lot um, and we're gonna have to skip most of it, but um, so let's skip over to, to Dade City's Wild Things. Um, I have some additional information here just in case we get into it in the Q&A. Um, but as you mentioned in 2016, PETA sued Dade City's Wild Things under the Federal Endangered Species Act, alleging that its practices of prematurely separating tiger cubs from their mothers and using them in photo op and swim with a tiger encounters uh, violates the Endangered Species Act. Um, we did this after pushing local, state, and federal law enforcement authorities for years to act. And when that didn't work, we decided to take these places on ourselves, and we started with Dade City's Wild Things. Um, we ended up winning the suit on default judgment because of a, a long number of um, uh, of, of stunts that the defendants pulled in this case, um, most notably um, trying to evade PETA's court ordered site inspection of the facility by transferring 19 tigers from their facility to Joe Exotics facility in Oklahoma in the heat of July in a metal cattle trailer with uh, absolutely no climate control um, and no water receptacles available for the animals. When they arrived, uh, they were starving for water. One of the tigers had given birth en route and all three of the cubs that she gave birth to had died. Um, so PETA won a default judgment in that case. Um, and, and thanks to that default judgment, Dade City's Wild Things uh, is permanently banned from owning or possessing endangered tigers or allowing anyone else to keep them on its property. Uh, shortly after we won that lawsuit, Dade City's Wild Things closed its doors for good. PETA rescued a total of 27 tigers from Dade City's Wild Things during that case. Um, and here are two of them, Remington and Luna, um, both of whom you can see um, on uh, PETA's undercover investigation video of, of Dade City's Wild Things, which you can find at PETA.org and hat tip to Scott Smith from Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge. Um, Turpentine Creek uh, is now home to these two beautiful tigers. 
So in our next case um, against Tim Stark and Wildlife in Need, let me play a video from that facility. We wanted to up the ante. So this time, instead of just suing on behalf of tigers, we sued on behalf of tigers, lions, and tiger-lion hybrids. And it was critically important for us to create this case law on hybrid big cats because exploiters were blasting on social media their plans to start exclusively breeding hybrid big cats in an attempt to evade PETA's lawsuits. Um, but PETA's position was based in part on some case law that holds that hybrids of two protected species are themselves protected. Um, again, much fascinating drama that we can't get into, um, but again, we won this time on partial summary judgment, which essentially means that the evidence in PETA's case was so overwhelming that a trial wasn't necessary. Um, so now Stark is prohibited from ever again owning ESA protected big cats. And this case established the first ever federal precedent holding that prematurely separating big cat cubs from their mothers and using them in public contact encounters violates the ESA. PETA rescued 22 big cats from wildlife in need um, following our lawsuit win. Again, a large number of them went to Turpentine Creek um, and wildlife in need is now also closed and there are no longer any more wildlife in need at Tim Stark's property um, thanks to PETA's lawsuit and a separate lawsuit by the Indiana Attorney General's office. So the third Cub petting related ESA suit um, will be against Jeff Lowe and his Tiger King Park. Um, the evidence, this suit has not been filed yet. Um, more on that in just a sec. Um, but to get an idea of the way that big cats suffer at Jeff Lowe's facility, um, this, is, this is Nala. Here's a, a video. What you're seeing here is something called metabolic bone disease. And we see this often in big cats who are rescued from roadside zoos. Um, and it's essentially caused by uh, big cat cubs not getting enough nutrition when they're babies. And it's an epidemic in, in cubs who are prematurely separated from their mothers as is necessary for cubs who are used in cub petting. Um, this is also Nala. Um, cats at Jeff Lowe's facility in Oklahoma um, suffered from horrific fly strike, which is when flies land on body parts of animals, typically their ears, um, lay eggs, and then the maggots eat away at the flesh. Um, so she's just one of the examples of, of the cubs um, who suffered at, at Jeff Lowe's facility. Um, and in this suit, again, we want to up the ante. And so this time P PETA is seeking to move the needle forward um, by alleging that the act of breeding hybridized big cats in itself is a violation of the ESA because of the well-documented lifelong physical, social, and psychological issues that are caused by breeding lions and tigers together. And some great news, after years of pushing the feds to take on the big cat cub petting industry, um, it's paid off. The US Department of Justice on behalf of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the USDA are also suing Jeff and Lauren Lowe um, in the Tiger King Park under both the ESA and the AWA. The DOJ adopted PETA's arguments, in some cases verbatim, from our Tim Stark lawsuit um, about premature maternal separation and cub petting encounters. And they explicitly relied on the precedent from PETA's case um, in, in their lawsuit. Thankfully, DOJ is aggressively pursuing their claims against Lowe. And while the case continues, the DOJ has already confiscated every single ESA protected big cat on the Lowe property and placed them at reputable sanctuaries. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that despite of all this progress, the Big Cat Public Safety Act is still critically important to sustain this process or to, st to sustain this progress and to strike the nail in this hideous industry for good. Um, this precedent is great, but it is not a statute on the books. And we need that because the worst abusers like Doc Antle and Mario Tabro are not going to stop until they're forced to. 
Um, so we'll end on a, a happy note. Uh, Nala, that sad lion cub that I showed you, uh, was actually rescued. That video was taken on her first day at sanctuary, thanks to excellent veterinary care from the Wild Animal Sanctuary. She has completely recovered, and here she is playing with her new pride. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Counselor Pete. That was wonderful. Very, very uplifting. But what our audience just heard was severe and repetitive abuse and neglect. You know, doesn't the USDA perform inspections of these zoos? One has to wonder. And isn't it their mandate to ensure that captive animals are treated in accordance with the law? Um, now, you've apprised the USDA for many years and through mil multiple industries, Professor Delciana Winders. Um, as a professor of law, what grade would you give the USDA? The USDA knows full well I would give it an F, and I'll tell you a little bit why. I could speak for hours and hours about this, but I'm going to try and stick to my five minutes. We'll see how I do. So. I think it's um, the USDA is nothing short of complicit in the suffering and deaths of many, many tigers and other captive wild animals because of their failure to enforce um, and implement the Federal Animal Welfare Act. Um, we've heard a lot about other agencies and organizations who are helping these animals when really the, the responsibility lies first and foremost with the US Department of Agriculture under the Federal Animal Welfare Act because anyone who is exhibiting animals to the public has to be licensed and inspected for compliance with minimum standards. And the USDA has repeatedly documented chronic violations at all of the players that you've heard about and many, many others um, and yet has renewed these folks licenses to exhibit animals year in and year out, even as they are causing immense suffering and deaths of animals. So um, what I would like to do is focus um, just on five examples. I've, I've written extensively and I've dedicated the bulk of my career over the last 15 years to challenging the USDA's failure. So um, we're gonna keep this at sort of a high level of example. So just bear in mind that these are five of many examples. Um, the, the first that I would like to start with is um, from Serenity Springs, uh, an operation that was in Colorado for a few decades, operated by a man named Nick Skulak that was one of the largest suppliers of tiger and other cubs across the country. And this photo is hard to see, and that's because I've chosen to use only photos that were taken by the US Department of Agriculture itself for this presentation. They're much better documentation. You saw some of the, the things that PETA, uh, that PETA took in, in Ms. Pete's presentation. They're undercover investigations that document the suffering much more clearly. And that's part and parcel of the problem is that the USDA isn't even adequately documenting these violations. But the, the truth remains that they are documenting them. They're fully aware of what is going on. And so what is actually happening here, and I'm, I apologize, these photos are somewhat upsetting. Um, they're not the most graphic by any means, but they are upsetting. Um, so what you see here is, um, here's the quote from the USDA's uh, caption, adult female cougar baby noted to be unmoving, stiff and covered in snow in shelter structure, not noticed by staff despite watering animals earlier in the day, end quote. So in case it isn't clear, baby is dead in this photograph. And in fact, just a few months before discovering baby's corpse, the USDA inspector had documented that many animals had been found dead and frozen in their cages at Skulak's facility. Um, there were a host of other Animal Welfare Act violations going on for years and years, including evading inspections, numerous tiger cub deaths, um, failure to provide veterinary care, including for painful conditions. I could go on and on, but um, the bottom line is that despite documenting these violations itself, year in and year out, the USDA renewed Skulak's license to exhibit animals, facilitated his continued breeding and cub petting, and it wasn't until 2017 when not the US Department of Agriculture, but a group called Tigers in America, 
along with Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, you'll hear from shortly, with the help of other sanctuaries, stepped in and finally put an end to this cycle of breeding and abuse and shut down the operation and rehomed more than 100 surviving animals. Um, and that this was only after the USDA had facilitated the breeding and the exploitation of hundreds of animals. One of the many facilities that Skulak supplied was GW Exotic of Tiger King Infamy, offered, operated first by Joe Exotic and then his successor, Jeff Lowe. Um, this is Nala, who Brittany spoke about. But before we even get to Nala, we have to go way back to when Joe Exotic first got a license decades ago. Um, he never should have been given a license to exhibit animals in the first place. Joe was given a license to exhibit animals in the wake of a botched animal rescue that involved shooting numerous animals. Then he almost immediately began being cited for Animal Welfare Act violations. There was a glimmer of hope in 2006 when the USDA took rare enforcement action, fined him $25,000, temporarily suspended his license, and most importantly, Joe agreed that his license would be permanently revoked if he committed violations in the subsequent 18 months. Not surprisingly, he repeatedly violated the Animal Welfare Act in those um, subsequent 18 months. PETA actually conducted an undercover investigation and documented him starving anim animals, routinely hitting, punching, kicking animals, spraying them with cold water, striking them with rakes and shovels, um, killing healthy tigers, uh, allowing tigers to attack a lion and chew her leg off, then not giving her treatment when she chewed off uh, her stitches um, and moaned for weeks while her wound was open. It goes on and on. If we had more time, um, I could I could inform you of it. Of course, the USDA was apprised of all of these violations, given documentation of them, reminded of their agreement with Joe Exotic, and did absolutely nothing except renew his license. Then, over a seven month period, twenty three tiger cubs died. By following a complaint from PETA, the USDA launched an investigation into that in 2010. Inexplicably, that investigation languished for years and years, and in fact was still open when Joe Exotic was arrested years later. In fact, at the time he was arrested, there were four open investigations that had been languishing. Um, so here again, the USDA not only failed to take enforcement action, but affirmatively facilitated ongoing suffering by renewing the license to do business. Um, so we're grateful that Joe was finally held accountable for various crimes and incapacitated, but we need to um, keep our eyes on the fact that the USDA knowingly allowed to, him to harm animals for two decades and then turned around and allowed Jeff Lowe to continue that cycle of abuse. So the caption for this photo, uh, which again, the USDA took itself is quote, lion club named Nala lying in the mud, cub is depressed, lethargic, and with purulent nasal and ocular discharge. Notably, despite documenting Nala and other animals in such appalling conditions, the USDA did not exercise its authority to confiscate her. She was left in Jeff Lowe's care for months after this photo was taken and this citation was issued. And as you heard from, from Ms. Pete, it was only when PETA, through its own separate legal efforts, um, was able to step in and rehome Nala that she was um, gotten to the wild animal sanctuary and finally started to get the care that she so desperately need, needed. And as, as Ms. Pete recommended, recognize the federal government is indeed now pursuing an action against Jeff Lowe. But again, that is only after the USDA for years routinely renewed his license to exhibit animals, despite a host of not only federal animal welfare act violations, but some state law wildlife violations as well. So our next example is another person you've already heard a bit about, um, Tim Stark, who you can see here roughly handling cubs who should still be with their mothers, which is his MO. The USDA notably did ultimately revoke Stark's license and fine him for well over a hundred Animal Welfare Act violations. But again, this was only after renewing his license for years and years, despite not just mounting violations of the Animal Welfare Act, but also a conviction for wildlife trafficking. 
Um, some of these violations that the USDA itself documented were dragging cubs by their legs, swatting tiger cubs with riding crops, and notably the inspector observed that the animals were basically non-responsive to these assaults because they were so exhausted because he was using them every single day without sufficient breaks. Um, other violations included out allowing children to be bitten, dropping terrified protesting cubs into the laps of members of the public, um, improperly feeding cubs, which as you've heard about results in metabolic bone disease, which Stark then proceeded to um, fail to treat. Um, and uh, he beat a leopard to death who was suffering from metabolic bone disease. Just the tip of the iceberg for Stark, which is moving along quickly. Um, next example, another one you heard about, Dade City's Wild Things. Um, the, the USDA uh, caption for this photo, which again is not a great photo, it's not that hard to take good photos these days, uh, quote, tiger with hair loss on face, neck, and body. This is one of many, many animals the USDA documented receiving inadequate veterinary care at Dade City Wild Things, um, in addition to things like chronic failure to provide sufficient shelter, improper handling, using physical abuse to handle cubs, including pulling tiger's tails to restrain them and holding a tiger cub up by his neck, um, et cetera. Here is another example where the USDA did take rare enforcement action, but that action was only initiated after many years of documenting mounting violations. And then the enforcement proceeding itself took years and ultimately resulted in a paltry fine that was just pennies on the dollar when compared to the potential fine that they could have faced under the statute. And they just had their license temporarily suspended rather than permanently revoked. And this is a chronic problem with the USDA's enforcement of the Federal Animal Welfare Act and the USDA's own Office of Inspector General has repeatedly condemned the agency for these enforcement failings. So, um, so far, thankfully, we've heard about folks who have been incapacitated, though not thanks to the US Department of Agriculture. The last person I want to mention is still out there exploiting and harming animals, and that is um, so-called Doc Antle of a facility called Tigers in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, the USDA's caption for this photo is underweight lion with multiple skin lesions. This is another animal who was denied veterinary care. Um, Antle is, as you may know, facing two felony charges for trafficking lions, um, state felony charges, as well as more than a dozen misdemeanor charges, but he remains licensed by the USDA to this day, despite those charges, despite a host of Animal Welfare Act violations, including endangering the public, chronic failure to provide adequate veterinary care, failure to provide cage space, clean water, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm just gonna put a couple further reading options, some of my scholarship on these issues, if you're interested in doing a deeper dive, because this is really just a very high level gloss. Um, but the bottom line is we're making tremendous progress around this issue. And that's thanks to the panelists you're hearing from today and many other people who are dedicating their lives to this work. Passing the Big Cat Public Safety Act is absolutely the critical next step that we need but we also can't let the USDA off the hook. So long as we're allowing tigers and other wild animals to be held captive, the USDA needs to be held accountable for its responsibility to ensure that they're given at least the minimal protections they're entitled to under the Animal Welfare Act. And that includes not issuing and not renewing licenses to known violators and taking meaningful enforcement action. Um, so thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions by email if we don't get to them during the Q&A and um, to share any of that scholarship if folks would like. And I probably went over my time and I apologize for that. Thank you very much, Professor Winders, for that insight into the USDA. Um, that was absolutely horrifying. Um, I guess you have to be near death if you're a tiger to be rescued from your abuser. And when animals are reaching that end of the line, the expert who has coordinated their rescue has been Kelly Donathan. Kelly directs the Global Animal Disaster Response Team at the Humane Society International. Ms. Donathan, you coordinated a huge rescue right here in upstate New York, didn't you? 
Yes, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. And uh, just to clarify, there are many people that um, are out there rescuing these animals and many of them are on this call today. And and uh, so I just wanted to share with you um, uh, operation that um, I was a part of when I was working for International Fund for Animal Welfare. And this um, was a case, let's see, there we go. Um, can you see the, the screen okay? Great. Um, so J and K Call of the Wild was um, a truly more of a, a defunct sanctuary or a pseudo sanctuary, which I believe you'll be hearing more about um, coming up. Um, it's they had lost their USDA license in 2014. This is actually not the first time, but as we just learned, oftentimes those USDA licenses were just handed back over, despite um, all of the uh, huge issues that were at the facility. Um, this time, uh, to some credit to the USDA uh, inspector and the local authorities, um, they really meant business. And uh, we tried working with the owners to uh, voluntarily place the animals or a sanctuary stepped up to take them, but um, they became uncooperative. And ultimately, um, we had to work with the authorities to, to um, execute a, a confiscation. Lions, tigers, and bears, plus two wolves, one fox, chickens, pigs, a broken down horse to be used as food, a dozen dogs, several cats, and a couple of rabbits, all living in a severely run down facility, parts of which resemble the set of a horror movie with the sickening stench of death and decay wafting from every corner of the property, JNK Call of the Wild Sanctuary in Sinclairville, New York was forcibly shuttered and its animals seized by local law enforcement. So this operation and many like them um, involves a ton of coordination and collaboration. Um, we had state and local law enforcement involved, the USDA. Um, I think we had about seven sanctuaries on site and um, uh, I'm sure many of them would tell you, as, as well as Carol, that you know it was quite complicated trying to, to access this facility. We did not know exactly what was going on there. Nobody had been on site for a few months, um, and this was an unannounced seizure, so the owners were not expecting us to come. Um, so it took a lot of uh, coordinating. We had to, um, I had to write affidavits to the judge to try to get um, a, a two-day warrant um, because we were concerned about not knowing exactly what we were walking into, being able to get all the animals off safely. And um, as well as, uh, and that involved, you know, uh, keeping the perimeter and the facility safe um, for 48 hours, um, which thankfully was, was able to be done. Um, obviously safety is one of the biggest things we're looking at, um, especially when we don't know exactly what we're walking into. Uh, we were not quite sure exactly what the current animal population was. It had been changing um, the last few uh, USDA inspection reports. Uh, there were, um, we, we were concerned about some potential resistance from the owners and or their supporters, although thankfully that was not um, uh, something we didn't have to worry about ultimately. Um, with all these people coming on site, actually, you know, animals get excited, potentially, potentially can turn aggressive, um, and just having so much law enforcement on site, um, especially someone like me who's not around guns a whole lot, it's a little concerning one, and they're not around big cats all the time. So we want to make sure we're all on the same page, we have clear communication, um, and that we're moving um, swiftly, but very cautiously. And uh, as well as just dealing with, with the facility as it was, um, you know, it was really broken down. You have rusted and not really well working cages. I'm trying to make sure that everything's at least secure enough for us to, to operate. Um, in that middle photo, you can see we had to actually cut into some of the, the enclosures to get the animals out. This is partially just because of the way um, the, air, the facility was set up. Um, we were, in the bottom photo, you can see you're loading a bear right in almost into the corner of the tiger's enclosure, which is very tight quarters in some of the areas. Um, and so it was, um, again, safety is top priority of people and the animals. So uh, it's, it takes a lot of, um, of working together. 
And uh, there were some additional complications. Um, we did at one point hear that there was um, a breach of the security and the owner's son did actually get through the forest on part of the property and came through. Um, and after talking with them, we were, um, we were able to, to work with him and, and give him time to kind of say goodbye to some of the animals. Um, as we've been hearing, there's just a, a lot of things that are involved, a lot of different um, mindsets and personalities and potential other psychological uh, things going on um, that involve, you know, get people involved in this kind of trade. And um, one of the other things is we found a number of domestic animals on site as well that we um, were able to quickly get a warrant for and seize them as well. And it was very hot. This was um, the, the day after Memorial Day in 2014. And we were having to constantly try to give water, water to the animals. They hadn't had a lot of water. We did have one scare um, when we had to anesthetize one of the lions. Thankfully, um, he pulled through and has continued to do really well at a sanctuary. And um, just show one more little clip. It appeared that the animals had not been fed or watered for days. There were also a vast variety of domestic animals on the property. There's rabbits bleeding, roaming around. Rabbits? Mm -hmm. We've got chickens, we've got dogs, we have quite a few shepherds up here. You've got potentially dogs in crates in the house. Some of these shepherds are pretty aggravated. Kelly needed to make sure there was a plan for rescuing all of them, not just the exotics. Most importantly, we need to focus, mm -hmm. you know, on what our task is at hand today. So it, you're seeing kind of all the different structures and trailers in there. Every time we walked in, we at first weren't sure what we were going to find in it. Usually we were finding some sort of animals or evidence of animals, but we also found plenty of evidence that, that big cats have been kept in some of those trailers. And we even had an animal fall through the bottom of one of the trailers at one point. Um, it was so rotted and coming apart. Um, so it's, uh, you know, every case is a little bit different, but I think a lot of these issues are things that people involved in rescue often um, see whether it is a confiscation or if it is a voluntary um, surrender. And, um, but I don't wanna leave you guys with those images. Um, thankfully, um, all these animals were, were safely transported to the sanctuary. Some of them um, were older and, and lived um, a, a shorter time afterwards, but at least had um, you know, that end of their life being really great. And uh, the, some of them are still doing really well at the sanctuaries. And um, if I can, I will just share one last little moment uh, with you guys. The first time, these are two things that you saw in the photo. Oh, she's just going to get rid of it. Oh, she's going to get rid of it. She goes straight in. So I will end with that and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so very much, Ms. Donathan, for uh, showing us all the various elements that comprise a complex multi-day rescue in New York. Now let's look at a rescue from a very different perspective through the eyes of an individual tiger cub. And joining us this afternoon is the vice president of Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, Scott Smith. Vice President Smith, can you share a biography of a particular tiger cub that you've rescued? You need to unmute Scott. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, you Tamara. <laughs> thank you, Tamara, for inviting me to speak today and for everybody watching. Thank you for caring. I'm honored to be a part of this discussion. This uh, meet Blackfire. He's a five and a half year old white tiger. 
In August of 2016, we received a call to go to Colorado to check on a facility known to engage in black market breeding practices. The visit was haunting, left scars in me until this very day. Some of the pictures I've seen during this uh, presentation have brought a lot of memories flooding, flooding back. 115 animals lived at that roadside breeding facility, and today we're gonna to talk about one of them, Blackfire. At the time this image was taken, Blackfire had already retired from his career as a petting cub. He had been tossed around from person to person for days on end. Think about this, would you allow your newborn baby to be handed to hundreds of people, hundreds of strangers? When we first laid eyes on him, he could barely walk. He was dragging his back legs, and if he tried to move at all, he would cry out loud. They had him separated from his two siblings because they were still walking and, and might injure him. We left that facility after this visit, knowing that we would be back to rescue all 115 big cats that site. After three weeks of planning meetings, the Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge Rescue Team arrived on site and immediately took full, full control of the rundown breeding facility. We knew Blackfire and his siblings were going to need immediate care. Their condition had advanced to the point where they could not walk. It was just too painful. A local veter veterinarian had seen the cubs and diagnosed them with metabolic bone disease. The team on site started to respond with calcium carbonate in the form of Rolaids. Too little, too late. Also notice the ringworm on his face. I mean, how many people walked away from this pay to play um, moment with a highly contagious fungal infection themselves from playing with black fire? Now, why is black fire in this situation? The nationwide problem with metabolic bone, metabolic bone disease in big cats is driven by greed and the vast lack of basic animal husbandry skills. This is Shakira on the left and Bosco on the right. They are the parents of black fire. Inbreeding is the only way to produce a white tiger, which is genetically inferior and leads to a plethora of health problems. Speed breeding, a common practice amongst unethical breeders further diminishes the genetic integrity of the offspring, in this case, Blackfire. Another common practice of unethical breeders is to pull the babies from their mother immediately after birth and attempt to make them tolerable of human handling. Nutrition is not the top concern for roadside breeders, so Blackfire didn't have much of a chance. Poor nutrition for his mom, poor nutrition for him. Here's a short video of Blackfire's mother, Shakira. She's distressed with a newborn cub. At the breeding facility in Colorado, Shakira had so many cubs that were taken from her immediately after birth that she just not, does not know what to do with them. You can see she's walking around with the cub in her mouth and there's a full grown tiger in the background. She may be a little concerned about the situation. It was not a breeding uh, facility or not a nice place for her to have her babies. Passage of the Big Cat and Public Safety Act would put an end to this humane, inhumane practice. Blackfire, along with his two siblings, were made comfortable with pain medications for the 14-hour journey to Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Immediately upon arrival, there was a veterinarian along with the Turpentine Creek team ready to do all they could to help the young tigers at our on-site Jackson Memorial Veterinarian Hospital. This is Blackfire sedated, ready for his comprehensive exam, including x-rays of his thin, flexible bones caused by metabolic bone disease. These two x-rays show that Blackfire definitely suffered from severe metabolic bone disease. Due to extremely low bone density, you can see the compound breaks here and up here with the red circles and a fracture in his pelvis here. And after close study of this x-ray with our current vet, she believes there was a break on this side as well. The image on the right shows another devastating result of metabolic bone disease. The x-ray shows the front legs. Blackfire's bones are so weak and soft that they're curved here 
It's supposed to be a straight bone, ladies and gentlemen. It's curved from the disease. And you can also see a compression fracture um, in the bone up in here. This, see how this femur goes down straight and this one is compressed right down on top of the knee. The image on the right shows another devastating result of metabolic bone disease. The radius and ulnus, you see how they're crossed here? They're supposed to be straight. They go in behind here and they bend right up into the bottom of the knee. It was also found that Blackfire, like many other cats with metabolic bone disease, has a narrow pelvis, which impacts the passage of digested food. This is all preventable by ending the unnecessary breeding of big cats for, non, for the non-sustainable cub petting industry. Obviously, Blackfire underwent immediate vet care. His nutritional needs were assessed and a course of action was planned and put into motion. First and foremost, Blackfire's new diet would can consist only of boneless meat for the rest of his life because of the narrow, narrow deformed pelvis. He was also put on a regimen of mineral oil, stool softeners, and milk. Feline tea, a feline-specific multivitamin, was added to the regimen along with calcium for bone strength. A pain management program was designed specifically for black fire and was implemented along with constant soft substrate like mulch or straw, and our team designed and built a half acre grassy habitat with a pool to promote easy living for Blackfire for the rest of his life. Two months later, Blackfire left the veterinarian hospital recovery area and was introduced into that new soft grassy habitat. And this image was taken last fall with Blackfire and his siblings at five years old. Blackfire's in the middle, with his head above the other tiger. And he does walk with a limp from the curved and front humerus, but plays and interacts with his uh, siblings very well. For the purpose of this biopic, Blackfire's siblings were not mentioned much, but each, of those, each one of those suffered as, just the same as he did. Again, this is all preventable. Pass the bill, stop the pain. Thanks for caring, you guys. I was honored to be here today. Thank you so much, Scott Smith, for that biopic of, of Blackfire. But, you know, as our audience has heard, Kelly Donathan had to rescue cats from J&K Sanctuary. And Dade City Wild Things also called itself a rescue and rehab center. You know, Carol Baskin, you are the CEO of Big Cat Rescue. Ken, is, is there a law that, that defines who can be called a sanctuary and who cannot? How does your average American know and, and distinguish between a real rescue and a pseudo sanctuary? Well, thank you. And obviously the answer is that they do not um, they do not differentiate between the two. Unfortunately, when Tiger King Murder, Mayhem and Madness played in 64 million homes last year, it portrayed sanctuaries as being no different from zoos and they are philosophically polar opposites. These are some before and after photos of places Big Cat Rescue saved wild cats from and how they live now. And you might notice that there has been some repetition between the different people here today. And that's because most of these places, we can't get in there and get the before photos. <laughs> Zoos buy, breed, and sell, and very few allow public contact and or take the animals off site. The US Fish and Wildlife Service definition of sanctuary is accredited wildlife sanctuary means a facility that cares for live specimens of one or more of the prohibited wildlife species and one is approved by the United States Internal Revenue Service as a corporation that is exempt from taxation, two does not commercially trade in prohibited wildlife species, including offspring parts and products, three does not propagate any of the prohibited wildlife species, and four does not allow any direct contact between the public and the prohibited wildlife species. The word sanctuary in the name doesn't make it so, like you saw with J&K's sanctuary. 
sanctuaries are defined by what they actually do. In addition to avoidance of what my husband calls the five sins, buying, breeding, selling, allowing contact, and taking off-site for exhibition, sanctuaries need to live up to the image the word inspires. They have to be a much better experience for the animals than where they came from. How can you tell a real sanctuary from a pseudo sanctuary? Real sanctuaries will be transparent and will welcome inspection and guidance from the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Transparency is key because there should be nothing to hide. They will make it easy for the public to see what happens in the day-to-day -day life of the animals, as well as in the finances and the management of the nonprofit. Zoos know how to talk the talk, but true sanctuaries walk the walk. You won't get mixed messages at a true sanctuary. Zoos talk about conservation as an excuse for breeding cute cubs to attract visitors and donors, but none of these big cats can ever go free. Sanctuaries should exist for one purpose only, and that is to end the abuse that causes a need for their existence. If they are not actively lobbying to end the cub petting and private possession, they don't understand the problem. And if they're posing with big cats and making them look like pets, they are the problem. How can wild animals survive without zoos and sanctuaries? The last 200 years of zoos and sanctuaries brought most exotic cat species to the edge of extinction. Zoos need to reinvent themselves as location-based centers of virtual reality, where people can see real animals living free via 360-degree live internet streaming cameras. The feeds to the cameras would provide income to those living with big cats to ensure healthy ecosystems with an abundance of opportunity to see wild cats living free. Right now is the most important time to roar out for big cats, and you can do so at bigcatact.com. If you go there and type in your name and address, our system can create an email, a tweet, and a script for you to read when it automatically dials your member of Congress. You can take all three actions or just one, but nothing happens to protect big cats without your voice. And it's not a moment too soon because we have to clean up our act in the US before we have any influence on the international trade in tiger parts and the cruel practice of tiger farming. When Big Cat Rescue President Jamie Veronica and our vet Dr. Justin Borstein went to CITES to do an event to educate people about tiger farming through giving away wine with labels that Jamie made about the cruel practice of tiger farming, the Chinese shot them down saying, at least we know where our tigers are. And that's true. In other countries, they are monitored by the government, but not in the US. Gabriel Fava, the tiger export at Born Free UK, our next speaker can tell you all about it. I'll be with you today, very early in the morning, my time. Apologies for the speed I'll be going also, but it'll be a quick overview of commercial tiger trade and its implications for wild tigers. So just to set the scene, get us all on the same page, some key facts about wild tigers. They now number somewhere in the vicinity of just 4,000 animals throughout their range. Around 60% of them are found in just one country, India. So that means that we have the largest population right next door to the largest demand country, China representing, of course, an ongoing uh, threat. As you might expect, the total ban on a cross-border trade in tigers and their parts and anything made from them has long been established since 1975 under CITES, the multilateral agreement which regulates commercial trade in wildlife. As far as domestic trade goes, in 2007, countries agreed to not breed tigers commercially for domestic trade as well and also that uh, breeding should only take place for conservation purposes. Unfortunately, there is a familiar gap here between policy and practice. Despite those agreements, some governments have been slow to implement them. Some have even adopted national policies which directly oppose and undermine them, seeking instead to regulate and encourage a healthy industry in captive bred tigers. Many of you, of course, will have heard of tiger farming in Asia, conjuring up images of battery-style 
row after row of tiny, barren, cramped, cement-floored enclosures, which are home to speedbred tigers hidden away from the public eye. But of course, there's a range of facilities, some with debatable attractions like live animal feeding, photo props, and also retail areas selling uh, products made from tigers found on site. Some are just retail outlets or even restaurants. Some simply have tigers passing through them on their way along the trade chain. Most of these are implicated in commercial trade, both legal and illegal. Poorly regulated jurisdictions, in conjunction with lax controls, facilitate the movement of tigers into both legal and illegal trade chains. Criminal syndicates take advantage of those conditions. Concerns over captive tigers and their breeding aren't confined to Asia, and there's a pressing need to look more closely at South Africa, Europe, and the United States. Healthy markets and the sources to feed demand are found the world over. That demand stimulation affects not only captive tigers. Wild tigers and their parts and products are considered more virile and stronger, which creates parallel markets depending on the client and on the price point. Unfortunately, we see this played out with other species too, such as the Asiatic black bear, whose farming for medicinal bear bar was introduced under the guise of assisting wild bear populations by providing a captive bed alternative and supposedly easing poaching pressure. This, of course, was at best a failed experiment, and the species not only isn't recovering in the wild, but the demand has stimulated poaching and illegal trade of bears further afield in North America. So making a product readily available has the opposite effect to satisfying demand. The wild tigers are very much in the crosshairs because of the trade in captive tigers. So let's be clear, tigers from these facilities serve no conservation purpose, whatever you may hear from the industry's champions and apologists. The commercial tiger industry has now developed to such a point that the number of captive tigers vastly outnumbers that of their wild counterparts. Just four Asian countries have a roughly estimated 7,000 captive tigers. In the US, there are rough estimates of between five and 10,000. Of course, meanwhile, the global tiger, wild tiger population is being propped up by heroic efforts to strengthen law enforcement, promote coexistence over conflict, oppose infrastructure developments which corrode the integrity of wildlife corridors. While in many key consumer countries, markets are constantly being stimulated. So tiger conservation initiatives are directly undermined when tigers are bred and traded, both legally and illegally, for sale and profit. So we see that the value of a tiger is transformed into an object of trade. And when that happens, it's still being considered as having a value in its own right and as an integral component of a healthy ecosystem, giving us essential services we often take for granted, we all lose out. So thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with Tamara, who will be able to connect with us. I can't be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for, for everyone's uh, presentation, and Carol, for segueing into the international conservation issue. Um, now I would... Uh, so ask if the panelists have any questions of each other. You have worked together, you know each other, perhaps you heard something new today and would like to explore it. So please, now's the time. I think our audience would be very interested. Thank you. You know, during the five year period that we were filming with the producers for Tiger King, they said that the name of their production was going to be called Stolen Wildlife. And we recommended everybody that you see on the screen here. I'm wondering how many of these people they actually interviewed, because I know they only gave Brittany Pete like three sentences in the thing, and I don't remember them using anything, but I'm wondering if they ever even bothered to talk to you guys, because you guys are the experts out there. Well, you can hear it on the first episode, you can hear me say two sentences but I think they pulled that off of something else. But he did approach me. I wasn't gonna have anything to do with him because I, I understood a little bit about him from Mike, the director, that he, that Eric wasn't, uh, there was something about him that was not right. And I was working on a project with Mike at the time. 
So you hear my voice in there. A lot of people after the first show go, oh yeah, Tim, you're on it. I no, no, I'm not on this, no. So um, yeah, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, they reached out, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have a good feel. And I, my wife was my, was my gauge and she said no. <laughs> so I decided not to. <laughs> Hey, Carol, to my um, knowledge, we did not hear from them what, at all. And I, I spoke with Eric in early stages when I was still with um, heading up the PETA Foundation's Captive Animal Law Enforcement Division, but it was really just because he wanted access to our undercover footage. He wasn't interested in my expertise as far as I know, and perhaps that's for the best in the end, I don't know. But um, Brittany did sit on camera and a little bit of it made it into the final cut, um, but certainly not enough. Yeah, it was such a, it, when my husband and I watched it, we just said, what a missed opportunity because they had access to all of you people that could have really told the story for Tigers. And so that upset us, I think more than anything. Well, let me ask everybody too, when you saw that first few minutes of the first show, when they went out, he was originally going to do reptiles. That's why he got a hold of myself and my brother Jim has a Kentucky Reptile Zoo in Venom Lab. He's kind of on the bit of the dark side himself. And they were reaching out to that. That's what it kind of was originally about, that he had an idea about. He went out and looked in that van and saw that snow leopard. When he opened up that door, I'm going, wow. I, when I saw the show, I thought, maybe he's going to find out where this hillbilly got this uh, snow leopard from and where's he going with it? I thought, well, he's gonna go over and see Carol that's just right across the state. No, he immediately goes from there to Oklahoma to Crazy Joe Exotic. So I thought, no, no, this, I'm done with this. This is not what it's supposed to be. That was a perfect opportunity to investigate and find out why that, where that snow leopard came from, but it dropped right through his hands. He had, he had no idea, no care about, about that cat. I will oh, admit sorry. that. Oh, sorry, Tim. I'm sorry. I was gonna say I. I will admit I have. I have not seen a minute of Tiger King. Um, yeah. I decided when I saw it coming out, I didn't have. I didn't feel it was gonna fall the way I know Carol. You and those of us would want to have seen that. You know, opportunity be in, in that kind of. Um, you know, huge streaming platform. Um, but I. I also thought you know, and I was. I. You know, I spent years trying to get USDA sending them all his videos and showing explaining all these reasons why they needed to do something and I thought he's stolen too much of my time already as long as he's going the way he should be it's not going to be but I I say that but I I mean obviously Carol you've you've bared the greatest brunt of that so I'm just just glad that that's that has all resolved as best as it it could so It was definitely, uh, since the new one, the conservation game, I don't know if you remember, Carol, somebody asked me about, uh, you know, Jack, Hannah, and some of the other stuff. And I said, well, whoa, whoa, this is not a human soap opera. This has nothing to do with the humans. This has to do with the animals. At this time, that show was reality TV, alleged, you know, reality TV. And it was, as, it was more of a human soap opera, whereas this is about the cats. This is what's happening to the cats. So I want to get them off that as fast as I can. I know you do the same thing, Carol. You just this is about the cats first, the conservation game, and the rest of it's, you know, there was a, a soap opera that he's trying to do. It's not. It was. It was uh, I. I feel sorry for you. Like I said, you know who was supporting you. We know what the truth was. So it's. It's. I'm glad that everything's coming out to be smoothing out now, and it, and it's going to be uh, everything's going to be much better for the cats. I. I just feel it. Now, there was a question that was posed by Marie Coco. I think that's to you, uh, Professor Winders. Um, it was about the USDA and whether it's your belief that they're negligent. Is it negligence or is it really, um, you know, is it just we're understaffed, we're underfunded, or are they really just looking the other way? Are they really just uncaring? Are they corrupt? Are they untrained? Or what, what is up with the USDA? All of the above. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of layers to it. And absolutely, the USDA should have ample funding for animal welfare. 
enforcement. Um, and they have about 100 inspectors for well over a million animals at about, about 11,000 locations. So that's obviously absurd. But the truth is that those inspectors do a good job. And they try to do a good job. Um, they're documenting these violations. And it's really higher up where nothing is getting done once those violations are documented. And so what we often see happen with those inspectors, either they leave because they care and they're doing, they're documenting this suffering and nothing is happening, or they just stop trying to document things. It's a very common occurrence. And so it's a much deeper structural issue with the USDA. They have actually, in certain years, asked Congress to give them less money for Animal Welfare Act enforcement than they had previously, which is unheard of for any agency to do. There, were, there was actually a year or two where they said, please don't give us any money for Animal Welfare Act enforcement, which is just really unheard of. And so it, it goes back to the very beginning when the Animal Welfare Act was in, in, uh, enacted in 1966, the USDA begged Congress to not give it responsibility for the statute. And um, the National Institutes of Health actually wanted responsibility because the statute was originally focused on animals used for experimentation. And after opposing the law, when the NIH saw that it was going to be enacted, they said, well, why don't you give us responsibility for it then? And Congress saw through that, um, that was problematic. And they said, well, the USDA, they deal with animals, meaning livestock, and they have relationships with state vets. So let's just give them the animal stuff. And um, I think that really set a poor foundation for an agency that has other priorities, primarily promoting agriculture and primarily animal agriculture, and is just not interested in animal protection. So I wanna be very clear that I do think there are good people within the agency, especially inspectors, but I think structurally it's set up for them to fail. And so, Ultimately, I think we need to have a new agency, an independent animal protection agency that isn't conflicted with these dual mandates. And it's not gonna be perfect. All agencies have problems, but it's going to give a fresh start and get rid of a lot of these really entrenched problems. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Winders. Now, Denise wanted to know if the Big Cat Public Safety Act bill passes, is all breeding of exotic cats finally going to stop? No, the Big Cat Public Safety Act only addresses the cub petting and the private ownership of big cats. So it bans cub petting. You can't pay to touch a cat or you can't go anywhere and touch a big cat or their cub. And the people who have these animals already as pets will be allowed to keep them. They have to register them and they're registering them so that we will know that they are not able to buy or breed more. And that's the only two things that the Big Cat Public Safety Act will do. Okay, but just thanks. to piggyback, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. Just to piggyback on that, by banning the direct contact, it is going to remove the incentive for the vast, vast majority of breeding. So indirectly, it will curb most breeding, um, we're probably still going to see some happening in accredited zoos and that kind of thing, but the most breeding of cubs is happening for cub encounters and it's a, a constant cycle and so it's going to remove that incentive, which is hugely important. Thank you. Thank you for for adding that important element, Professor Winders. Now we have a PhD student, a, a psych student, Victoria O'Connor. Um, she's not a panelist, but I've given her panelists, I've promoted her to panelist. I, I don't know if she can hear me and if she can unmute herself, but she did have a very interesting question for Tim Harrison. And her question stems from the research that she and her mentor, Professor Jennifer Vonk are doing on this interplay between dark personality traits and um, the tendency to own and prefer exotic animals. Um, so narcissism, psychopathy. Um, Victoria, if you're in the audience, I think you can now uh, put yourself on video and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, so as a PhD student, I studied the cognition of big cats in accredited facilities, and I was angered and enraptured by Tiger King and all the ways that I'm sure you guys were. Um, so we asked a survey and in the early stages of the results, we've seen that 
approval of owning an exotic animal was connected to those dark personality traits, um, narcissism, psychopathy, all of those things. So do you think this explains the connection between criminality and exotic pet ownership? And do you think it explains the whole picture or just part of it? Well, from my point of view as a law enforcement officer and being involved in this world for over 47 years, I, I've looked at it kind of go from people that were good people, like you saw in the elephant in the living room, Terry Brumfield, who would buy the lions or he'd buy these animals thinking he'd be the lion man, he's going to save them. And he's going to you know, take care of them and be that individual to individuals like Joe Exotic. And some people forget, I knew Joe Exotic when he was young. He actually used to tell everybody, and he started off with a mentality that he was nobody else should own these. And then when fame, ego, and money got involved, money changes everything. His, he went into that narcissist. He was already a narcissist already, but he just blew that narcissism out of control. Once he had people coming to him and he could hold a tiger, and all of a sudden they started looking at him as the tiger man, right? The tiger king. So that's where he got his fame at. And that's what he fed off of. So you're, what, what your research is going to prove is that we, what we all know already, all of us have worked with these people over the years. You know, Doc Antle is a perfect example. If you saw him on the National Geographic show when he was being interviewed, Carney Ann Nasser was on that one where he talks, I am the only one using his finger that knows anything about this. The rest of you are Al Qaeda. When he said that, I'm like, I know this dude. I've known him for years. Other people started calling me who actually been to his place that I didn't know he was that wacko. And I says, no, you don't. When he talks, he talks beautifully. He can communicate beautifully because he knows how to bring in the cult mentality that he's the hero. He's the one saving the earth, even though he's not. But that gets that, builds that head up that he builds that mentality up. But one thing I like to also tell you too, but look at the athletes. The athletes, as soon as they get money, just as soon as they get money, they got to go out and buy themselves. Well, Mayweather, the boxer, he's got a cheetah and he's got a tiger. Mike Tyson, the state of Ohio, just up the road from me, we helped get those off his property. White tigers. He had to get tigers immediately. It's not that he's a cruel person, that he, you know, he was a narcissist about tigers. He just had to have one. Once they got that idea, they got a little fame, a little money. That's part of, like I like to call it, a social expectation of people who become wealthy in the United States of America. Now I'm getting them from all over the world. Saudi Arabia is big over there. Some of the individuals over there, Europe. Australia's got a little bit starting up now. So the whole thing is, is once you get money, once you get that attitude, there's another concept of it there. And then there's just the people just are pure bad, you know, just absolutely bad. They look at it as quick money, like Mario. Quick money, I can make money off this. I kind of like these animals. I like the, the feel of being around them. But also I make more money off of doing this. He said it right to my face. I make more money off of doing this and just get a slap on the hand than I was selling drugs. All right. So that puts you right into the category of what you're doing, the investigation right there. So there's a whole grouping of different kind of avenues that goes out. But there is one key to it, narcissism. They believe they're the only ones. If you ever talk to anybody who's allegedly owns big cats, I just got off a, a TikTok thing. There's every other TikTok is somebody with wrestling a big cat. And I just get on there and just say, why? And they always come back because I know what I'm doing. I know who I am. I know how to handle these animals. And we all know, as Carol and the rest of you can say up there, and the professor and, and you know, Scott too, these are the people that we're gonna be seeing in the emergency room. Thank you, Tim. One final question, um, and this one from Iwa Laska. She uh, referenced our discussion about what is a sanctuary, what is a true uh, refuge, and what is a pseudo sanctuary. She wanted to know what about AZA accredited zoos? She thought that um, we represented most zoos as bad places. What if they're AZA accredited? Does that make them better? Anyone jump in? Carol? I can okay. jump in on Carol if you want to go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and then maybe you can add on. Um, so, Fewer than 10% of animal exhibitors are accredited by the American um, Association of Zoos. 
yeah, the AZA. Um, so it's a very small percentage and they do have better standards and, you know, third party accreditation. So I would say, yes, it's better. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, there are still problems, but AZA accreditation is much better than no accreditation. And it's better than some of these pseudo accrediting bodies that are popping up like the ZAA and others. And um, that's one of the articles that I put up on the further reading list is really delves into this question of accreditation because there's a real push now that the public is a little bit aware of these issues to want to try to seem like you're doing the right thing. And, and so places are trying to prey on that. And so I would say it's better, it's not perfect. Um, the, the gold standard is the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which uh, of course Carol's Place is accredited by. Um, and even there, it's not perfect. I mean, issues are going to come up when you're dealing with captive wild animals, but when you at least have meaningful standards and you have third party inspections to do what the USDA is not doing, there's some sort of check that's happening. So Carol, I don't know if you wanna to add to that. Well, it's just the philosophical difference to me. I mean, you are absolutely right in everything that you said, but zoos are in the business of having animals in cages and sanctuaries are in the business of there not being animals in cages. So it, it's just that simple. And I think zoos are going to have to remake themselves into what they have claimed they have been for years. They say they're all about conservation. Well, then they need to set it up so that people are seeing animals in the wild and that money is going back into the wild and doing those conservation things, not what we currently think of as zoos. I, I have to agree with that. I think the entire zoo philosophy of let's go see animals caged behind bars is 19th century and you know is extremely exploitative. Uh, I, I do believe that there is a, you know, gray, um, you know, that there, that there is a, a standard and that, that you know some zoos are better than others and so on but philosophically philosophically i do not want zoos and some of them continue to do this to breed animals to you know attract the public because of cute cubs um, of any species i want them to take their money and divest and, and invest it in places in the world where these animals are free because that's the bottom line. That is the heart of these animals, to be free. Carol, forgive me, but not even to be in a sanctuary. <laughs> they, they belong in the I wild. Agree. <laughs> I was going to say, that's, the wild. that's your mission. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, that's all of our missions. And I'm, I, I thank the panel and our audience. Thank you for staying with us and for asking your questions, for answering those questions. So thank you all very, very much and until the next webinar.